Welcome to the next lecture in the series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to talk about atomic multiplets. Now, in the previous lectures, we have been talking about Coulomb interaction and what happens when you have locally zero, one or two electrons um, taking an S shell and how this will influence, um, how this is influenced by the repulsion between the electrons. We included a local Hubbard U, which then suppressed charge fluctuations. Whenever we have um, systems with open shells, such as transition metal or rare earth compounds, then you will have not just the total number of charge that is important locally, but you will notice that locally electrons also have an additional degrees of freedom, namely the orbital the angular momentum or the m quantum number within atoms. And this actually is a very important internal degree of freedom, especially with respect to the local Coulomb interaction. Let's make a small example. If we take locally a D shell and assume that we have two electrons locally. So, and in that case, we would say we have a D2 configuration. And there are many different ways in which we can place these two electrons in the 10 spin orbitals that we have locally. And if we, for example, assume that one electron goes into the x square minus y square orbital, Then the other electron still has nine possible orbitals in which it can go. And if we now look, for example, at the case where this electron goes in the 3z square minus r square orbital, that is a lobe in the z direction, then the electron charge densities are far apart from each other. Whereas we could also assume that the electron goes into the x square minus y square orbital, of course, once with spin up and spin down, and then the electron charge densities completely overlap with each other. Now you can already imagine that the Coulomb interaction in this case is smaller than the Coulomb interaction in the case where the electrons are in the same orbital and therefore have a much larger density overlap. Now the Coulomb energy scale that governs these energy differences is the Rydberg energy scale. So compared to the bandwidth, which is electron volts to Rydberg's, this is definitely not a small um, energy scale that is involved in your systems. Furthermore, it is important to notice that um, the monopole part of your Coulomb interaction, so the question if you have locally one, two or three electrons, can be screened in a dielectricum and which happens in solids such that the atomic interactions that you calculate are much larger than the effective interactions that you would need when you make a single band model in your system. The interactions that we have here depend on local shapes, the way you arrange locally your electrons, and to screen such kind of differences in the Coulomb interaction between charges that have different shapes, involves higher multipole interactions and that is much harder to screen. First of all, because multipole interactions fall off much faster with distance. And secondly, because you have to have basis states that can make and mimic these kind of charge distributions in your solid. Whereas when you just have an S orbital locally, you can never screen the difference between these two interactions. Such that um, the energy scales that we have in a solid are actually pretty large for the energy differences between these kinds of arrangements between electrons. Now, this is important when we look, for example, at magnetism. Magnetism is a result of having open shells. And if you have locally two electrons, then if you want to just minimize the kinetic energy, you should put them in the same orbital with opposite spin. 
but as this interaction is large, you would probably prefer to locally put them with parallel spins in different orbitals. And then the question on what is your local moment, how is your local charge distributed, and what are therefore the interactions between atoms is highly determined by these kind of Coulomb interactions locally between the different shapes of the different orbitals of the electrons involved. Now it's not only important for magnetism, if you look for example at the binding of oxygen in blood, so to the iron side in heme, then it is highly uh, regulated by changing the orbitals which the iron occupies. When the oxygen is bonded, the electrons sit in the same orbital. When the oxygen is not bonded, the electrons sit in different orbitals, getting you the local magnetic moment that HEMA has. So the unsaturated HEMA has a magnetic moment, the HEMA with an oxygen bond loses its magnetic moment. And that of course is an energy balance that is highly important to be able to accept oxygen in the lungs and let it go in muscular tissue. So being able to calculate this really requires you to take the local atomic multiplets into account. Um, there are many more of such kind of examples. Uh, the manganese complex in photosystem 2, many of the active centers in enzymes. Uh, there this is important. Then there's um, also in solids, this can be important if you look at uh, windows in old churches, then they have very vibrant colors and those are exactly given by multiplets of different uh, atomic configurations of transition metal compounds. So there are several cases where the local atomic multiplets really determine the physics of your system. So let's have a look how we can describe those and what they do to the states that we have in a solid. Well, we can start with the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian that we have is the Coulomb interaction, 4 pi epsilon 0 to get us i units, a half, because I'm going to sum over the two electrons where uh, the coordinates are different, so we have the interaction between coordinate 1 and 2 and coordinate 2 and 1, and of course the Coulomb interaction should only be taken a single time between each pair of an electron. So instead of a half sum over i equal to j, you could also sum a half i smaller than j. Uh, without a half, the sum over i smaller than j. But that's our Coulomb interaction. We want to work in second quantization where we can pick a basis set. So we can sum over four basis functions. And then we have an interaction strength that depends on the four basis functions that we have. We have two creation and two annihilation operators, tau 1, 2, tau 3, tau 4. And the creation of particle tau i out of the vacuum creates the particle in a basis. And this is the one particle basis. Now, in principle, we can have a general basis function where spin and or of uh, spatial coordinates are intertwined. We have seen such kind of basis functions when we include spin orbit coupling, there the spin direction of the electron rotates in space. Um, I want to simplify my notation a little bit, so I'm going to assume that these are spinners times coordinate wave functions. So if I look at the projection of my wave function on a delta function, then of my state on a delta function, then this is a coordinate wave function times a spinner. So I'm assuming that the spin of my basis functions always points in the same direction everywhere in space. We can always make linear combinations afterwards, but this just simplifies the notation a little bit. 
In this case, I can write for my Coulomb interaction tau 1 up to tau 4 that this is a sum where I have the spin of particle 1 and particle 4 to be the same, the spin of particle 2 and particle 3. So the creation here and annihilation there and there have to be the same. Then I have my 4 pi epsilon 0, the interaction strength a half, because I'm again integrating over all possible coordinate combinations. And then we have the wave function for particle 1 at coordinate 1, the wave function for particle 2 at coordinate 2, the interaction e square over r1 minus r2, the distance between our electrons, and then particle 4 at coordinate 1, and particle 3 at coordinate 2. So particle 2 and 3, 1 and 4 have the same coordinates, and that integrated over whole space. D3 R1 and D3 R2. No need to put brackets there. Now in order not to have to write out our integrals, we can make graphical representations of our Coulomb interaction. And our Coulomb interaction can be depicted as a scattering event where particle 4 scatters to particle 1 and particles with quantum number 3 scatters to the particle with quantum numbers one, uh, 2. And then the strength of this scattering channel is given by the parameter u that depends on the for quantum numbers. Now for our basis, we have the states a dagger tau i out of the vacuum. And in principle, we are allowed to take any basis. Plane waves are fine, but if we take these kind of integrals over plane waves, then you have this divergent Coulomb interaction. So plane waves are not a nice basis set to work on. It's easy to make a complete basis set, but for your integrals it's not the most preferable basis set. Um, we have seen a similar problem of diverging interactions for the interaction with the nuclear potential, and therefore we there used atom-centered wave functions, and that's what we're going to do again. And the wave functions that we choose are atom-centered Vanier functions. Now, in a solid, the Vanier functions must not consist of a singular angular momenta around the nucleus. Um, and for Coulomb propulsion, it's nice to expand on spherical functions. So we're going to expand our Vanier functions on spherical functions. So we're going to use an additional spherical basis. Which we can now quantify with the quantum numbers n, l, m and sigma. And those are the quantum numbers that we have seen for the hydrogen atom, for example. And then our wave function, our Bonnier function, centered around site R, or centered around site minus R, can be written as a sum over all coordinates. And then we have alpha tau, n, l, m, sigma, where this is just a complex number, giving you the expansion coefficients. Then our spinner, y, l, m, theta, phi, r, n, l, of r. Note that our quantum numbers here, especially n, should sum over the bound but also the unbound basis.
So n is an element of all integers, all positive integers, and all real numbers for the bound and the unbound states, the continuum set of unbound states. Now, we can express our scattering strength u in terms of the scattering strength u for our spherical basis functions. So the scattering strength on the Bernier function basis, or basically any basis that we can expand in terms of spherical harmonics times the radial wave function, is given by the coefficients alpha tau 1, n1, l1, m1, sigma 1, up to alpha, and the 1 and 2 are complex conjugated, alpha tau 4, n4, l4, m4, sigma 4, times the Kolomb integral that we have on our spherical basis, n1, l1, m1, sigma 1, n4, l4, m4, sigma 4. So we have here a single parameter with 16 indices, and let's introduce some shorthand notation, 1, 2, 3, 4, where this stands for the quantum numbers of basis state 1, basis state 2, basis state 3, and basis state 4 within the scattering process. Now, we have a spherical basis. And the reason that I like spherical basis sets is because we know the integrals over the angular part for such kind of basis sets and interactions. We have our basis function that is spherical on one side and the basis function that is a spherical harmonics on the other side. And our interaction can be expanded on spherical harmonics such that the only thing that we need to know is an integral over three spherical harmonics, and these are analytically known. The expressions are not extremely compact, but they are known in terms of factorials and sums over factorials of all the indices that we have. So they are easy to calculate, and um, now and then you can even do the analytical derivations. So in order to use this, we have to expand our interaction, our Coulomb interaction, that depends on the distance between the two electrons in terms of spherical harmonics. And we can do that. So the expansion of 1 over Ri minus Rj is an expansion in terms of spherical harmonics. So we sum over the length of your angular momenta then we sum over the projection of your angular momenta on the z-axis, so the complete basis set of spherical harmonics. And then we have our expansion on spherical harmonics that comes with a prefactor of 4 pi over 2k plus 1. We have the dependence on the radial part, which is the minimum of the two radial coordinates to the power k divided by the maximum of the two coordinates to the power k plus 1. And then our spherical harmonic and k of the radial coordinates of the first particle times the spherical harmonics of the radial coordinates of the second particle, and this one is complex conjugated. Um, if we now do integrals, then the integrals over the angular part you can do analytically, and the integral over the radial part is nice and continuous, except for the case where r is equal to zero, because there it is a one over r kind of behavior. But the good thing is that when you do such kind of integrals, you get your volume element that goes with r square, such that in the end you always have an r square divided by r, so an r 
in there, such that this integral is completely um, analytical and has no poles anymore. So by going to spherical coordinates, you change a six-dimensional integral over something that is highly divergent. Actually, it's uh, divergent in three-dimensional volume, where Ri is equal to Rj, into a two-dimensional integral over the length of R and the length of R, the length of Ri and the length of Rj of an integrand that is fully analytical. And of course, you still have the two integrals over your angular coordinates, but those you can do analytical. So with this, our Coulomb parameter is given by a half, and then we have a delta function between the projection of the angular momenta on the z-axis. We will get them in a moment to where this delta function comes from. We have a delta function between the spins of the particles between 1 and 4 and between 2 and 3, as photons do not carry spin in the sense of the spin of an electron. And then we have our sum over k is 0 to infinite. The sum over m disappears, because if you have an integral over three spherical harmonics, it is only non-zero if the total projection of the angular momenta of the product of these three is zero. So we have the selection rule that um, m2 plus m3 must be equal to m1. And that is where this delta function comes from. And then we have our 4 pi over 2k plus 1, which we had here. Then the integrals over the spherical harmonics, m1, l1, yk, and m is now equal to m1 minus m4, otherwise this spherical harmonic, this integral over three spherical harmonics would be 0, l4, and the same for the other two particles, or the other particle that scatters m3 and l3 can scatter by the change of an angular momentum k and m3 minus m2, two particle with quantum numbers 2. And this one has to be equal to that one because both were m in your expansion and that's where the delta function comes from. And this has to be multiplied with an integral over your radial coordinates. And that integral over the radial coordinates is equal to e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. An integral over r1 and r2 the minimum to the power k divided by the maximum to the power k plus 1, r1, r1, r2, r2, r3, r2, r4, r1, two of them complex conjugated whereby your radial function is normally real, r1 square, r2 square, and this of course nicely removes the pole that we otherwise had, dr1, dr2. The first part can be solved completely analytical. The integrals over the radial functions are known as Slater integrals. And an important case is the case where we look at the interaction between electrons within the same shell. And in that case, when we know that n1 is n2 is n3 is n4, and l1 is l2 is l3 is l4, we will call rk1234 f of k. And that's the most common Slater integral that we encounter. 
And of course, we used here that we have conservation of angular momenta such that uh, m here must be equal to m1 minus m4, and here m must be equal to m3 minus m2, which is expressed in the delta function that we have. Now the conservation of angular momenta doesn't only hold for m, it also holds or gives you a relation between L1k and L4, or between L3k and L2. But now one should realize that the angular momentum actually is a vector. So if we say you come in with an angular momentum of 1 and you go out with an angular momentum of 4, then the exchange of angular momentum can be 0 when the two vectors are parallel, but when the two vectors are anti-parallel, you can exchange an angular momentum that is actually equal to L1 plus L4. Well, then it's only zero if the two vectors are equal in length. If one vector is much longer than the other, then there is a minimal exchange in angular momenta that you have to allow this scattering. So if we draw a picture where we show our scattering, then we go from a particle with quantum numbers 4 to a particle with quantum numbers 1 and we go a particle with quantum numbers 3 to a particle with quantum numbers 2 and we do this by exchanging an angular momenta k and m Now, photons do not interact with spin, and of course Coulomb interaction can be seen as the interaction with a photon of one electron and the interaction of a photon of the other electron. So we know that sigma 1 must be equal to sigma 4, and sigma 2 must be equal to sigma 3. Then we also know that angular momentum is conserved, so m4 becomes m1 plus m, or m1 is m4 minus m, because your angular momenta either goes into the electron or into the exchange particle, and then is absorbed by the other electron. So m2 is equal to m3 plus m. And we can now write a similar equation for the l and k vectors, but now we should realize that these are vectors so the vector L1 plus the vector K should be the vector L4, and the vector L2 minus K should be uh, L3. L3 plus K is L2. That gives a relation for the length of our vectors, and we know that the length of L1 minus L4 is smaller or equal to K, is smaller or equal to K as L1 plus L4, K is the amount of angular momentum exchanged between the two, and that can never be bigger than if you just add the two lengths, you go from fully down to fully up, and it must be larger than the difference between the two. And a similar relation holds between L2 and L3. Then there is one more relation that we have and that is if you have an integral over three spherical harmonics, then an integral over a function that is odd is always zero. So this product has to be even. And we know that our spherical harmonics with odd angular momentum are odd. So the product of the three of them must be even. So L3 plus K plus L2 must be equal to, e, must be even, or L1 plus L4 plus K must be even. L2 plus L3 plus K must be even, and if I sum the two, then I know that L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus L4 must be even. And these sets of rules are known as the triangular equations. you must be able to make a triangle of L1, L4, and K in order to have an allowed scattering process. 
Now that is of course very nice. In our expansion we do not have to sum over all possible angular momenta, but only of the angular momenta that allow you the scattering. So for the interaction between 2D electrons, we know that L is 2, so K can be anywhere between 0 and 4, and it must be even, so we have the integral with K is 0, K is 2, and K is 4. The scattering between two F electrons, you get an additional K is 6. Then, of course, when you look at Vernier functions, you have some admixture of higher angular momenta. But we also know that the higher the angular momenta, the higher the energy of the local state is, such that actually we do not have to mix in very high angular momenta in your Vernier functions to get a good description of the physics of your system. So by just looking at the atomic Slater integrals, you normally capture about 80% of the energy or more that you have due to Coulomb interaction, um, which is well, pretty good. It allows you to get quantitative but not extremely accurate. And then to get the accuracy, you have to expand your sums over the other angular momenta, which of course computers can do without any problem. But you get the basic understanding of all the possibilities without this additional sum by just looking at the atomic states. So that's what uh, we're going to do now. Have a look at the atomic eigenstates. In order to diagonalize the Coulomb Hamiltonian on the basis of the atomic wave functions, um, we can use the commutation relations and the symmetry that we have in our operator. And for that, we first going to look at some angular momenta operators, and I'm going to use capital letters for total angular momenta and small letters for the angular momenta of single electrons. So for the spin, we have the x, y, and z component of the spin that makes you a total vector, S, and the total spin operator is the sum over the spins of each electron. So we sum over all electrons. And instead of looking at the spin, we can also look at the angular momenta of the electron. Now, when you think of the angular momenta of an electron in a solid or molecule, that is not necessarily well defined. But in our case, we have poles in the potential at the nuclei of all the atoms. And we look at the Vanier functions centered around a single atom. And then the angular momenta around this pole, this diverging part of the potential, is very well defined. And the angular momenta of a single electron is given as R cross P, just as we have classical, but the difference of course that the momentum is now an operator, such that if you look at the X component, this is minus I H bar, uh, the Y component times D derivative of the Z component minus Z, the derivative of Y. And similar relations for the x and y component of the angular momenta operator. Now our Coulomb operator is spherically symmetric. It commutes with the spin. It commutes with the angular momenta. And we know that all components of the angular momenta compute, commute with all components of the spin. And of course, the x component of the spin doesn't commute with the y component of the spin. And very important as well, your Coulomb operator does not compute, commute with the angular momenta, nor with the spin of a single electron. If you look at the interaction between two electrons and you rotate one electron around the nucleus, it will get closer or further away to another electron. And that definitely does not conserve your energy such that the commutation relations with a single electron are zero, are non-zero. 
but of course when you rotate everything then your spherical is symmetric. Now we can use this to label the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian are simultaneously also eigenstates of L square, LZ, S square, and SZ. Um, such that we can use this to label our states with the quantum numbers alpha. You might have states that have the same angular momenta but different energies. L, LZ, S, SZ. Now in my notation I normally do not distinguish between operators and expectation values. It's almost always clear from the context what is an operator and what is an expectation value. And in the few cases that is not, I'll make a remark that you know that this is an operator or a number. So the expectation values of our operators are the ones that you've seen before in a quantum physics lecture. The expectation value of L square is h bar square L, L plus one times the wave function And the same for S square and the expectation value of LZ of that state is H bar LZ times that state. Now, what makes this powerful is that we can define the raising and lowering operators LX plus minus I LY and the same for the spin. And when you act with the raising or lowering operator on your state, then this is equal to h bar square root of L plus minus LZ plus one square root of L minus plus LZ times the state, but now the LZ quantum number raised or lowered by one. And similar for the spin, where you now get S plus minus SZ and raise or lower the expectation value of SZ. And of course, we know that when our Hamiltonian commutes with L, it also commutes with linear combinations of its components. So the Hamiltonian commutes with the raising or lowering operator for the angular momenta and similar for the spin. Now as our Hamiltonian commutes with L plus minus and L plus minus relates states with same L and S but different LZ or SZ, we know that we have some degeneracies, states with the same energy, and if you look at H L plus minus acting on the state Then because L plus minus commutes with H, this has to be the same as acting in the different order. And from this it follows that the Hamiltonian acting on, and now we have a number, the square root L plus minus LZ plus one L minus plus LZ acting on the state alpha L, LZ plus minus one S, SZ is equal to L plus minus, and there we let the Hamiltonian act on this state, and we know that this is an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, alpha L, LZ, S, SZ, times the state 
And now we can here have the Hamiltonian act on your state because this is another number and we can have the raising or lowering operator acting on that state because this is just a number. And that gives you here the energy of the state alpha L Lz plus minus one S Sz times the number that you get because of the raising or lowering operator times the state is equal to the energy alpha L Lz S Sz times the number that you get acting with the raising or lowering operator on this state, which is the same number as we have here, times the state after raising or lowering it, which is the same state as we has there, have there. So from this it follows that the energy of the state with the same L and S is the same for the energy where we have Lz one higher or one lower. Or in other words, the energy is independent of Lz and Sz and only depends on L and S and alpha. Now we're going to call the set of states with the same alpha, L and S, a term. Now the degeneracy of that term is given by 2S plus 1 for the possible values of Sz going from minus S to plus S times 2L plus 1 for the possible values of Lz and that is the degeneracy of the term. The degeneracy tells you how much states with the same energy you have when you consider Coulomb interaction. Now with this we know how to label our states. We know that if we have one state in a set of degenerate states, how we can generate the other states with the same energy. And now we are left with the question how to find explicit representations for your eigenstates of your Hamiltonian. So for this we'll have a look at an example. How to find the possible atomic terms and their energies. And for that we will look at a specific configuration. And the configurations are given by specific fillings of the shells, of the subshells. And as an example we'll have a look at a D2 configuration. So two electrons in the D shell. Now the first question that we should ask ourselves is when I have such a configuration, how many possible states do I have? So how big is my Hilbert space when I have two electrons in the D shell? And the first electron can be placed in 10 different spin orbitals the second electron can be placed in nine different spin orbitals because we have the Pauli principle, you cannot place the electrons in the same spin orbital. And we have 10 because the D shell is 10 fold uh, degenerate. There are 10 microstates in there, five because of angular momenta, two because of spin. And then of course we should realize that electrons are equivalent. So placing the first in orbital one and the second in orbital two is the same as placing the second in orbital two and the first in orbital one. So there are 45 states in there. And this can actually be calculated by the binomial in how many ways can I put two electrons in 10 orbitals. 
So in order to now find which atomic terms we have and what the values are, we have to find the possible values of L and S. So what is the possible total spin that I can have with two electrons? And what is the possible angular momentum that I can have with two electrons in a D shell? Now we can already start guessing. If I have two electrons, each has spin a half, then the maximum total spin that you can get is one when they are parallel, or when they are anti-parallel, you might get a spin of zero. So S should be zero or one. The same for the angular momenta. If I have a D shell, then the angular momentum of each electron is maximum two. If I place these factors parallel, then the maximum total angular momentum that you can get is four, and the minimum is zero. But now it starts to get a bit more complicated because if I put my angular momentum parallel and I want to put my spin parallel as well, then you run into problems with the Pauli principle that doesn't allow all possible combinations. So in order to look at the possible values of L and S, we're going to sort the microstates or the states by LZ and SZ. If you look at textbooks uh, in the 60s, they still call them microstates, just as you do in statistical physics. But let's sort our 45 states that we have in terms of L and S. And the way I'm going to label my states is by LZ, SZ for electron 1 and then LZ, SZ for electron 2. So our configuration is D2. I have my total SZ, which can be 0 or 1. I have LZ, which can be 4, 3, 2, 1 or 0. And then of course SZ can also be minus 1 or LZ can be minus 1 up to minus 4. But at that point your states just uh, repeat themselves such that when I know the possible microstates that I have for SZ and LZ positive, I can always generate those for the negative values. When I want LZ to be 4, then I have to take my two electrons both with LZ is equal to 2, and because of the Pauli principle, one has to be spin up and one has to be spin down. If I want to have SZ equal to 2, then I have to have both electrons with spin up, and this I can only do if they have different LZ, because otherwise the Pauli principle would forbid that state. So there is no 2 up, 2 up microstate. And then I can lower my angular momenta projected on the z direction by 1 or by 2 and it is 2 up minus 1 up and there are two ways I can do this. I can have zero, 1 up and 0 up and then I have 2 up minus 2 up or 1 up minus 1 up. For Z is equal to 0 and LZ is 4, I have the state with 2 up 2 down. If I now lower my LZ by 1, I can have either 2 up 1 down or 1 up 2 down. If I lower one more, I have 2 up 0 down or 1 up 1 down or 0 up 2 down. I lower one more, 2 up minus 1 down, 1 up 0 down. 0 up, 1 down, minus 1 up, 2 down. And now I lower even one more, 2 up, minus 2 down, 1 up, minus 1 down, 0 up, 0 down, minus 1 up, 1 down, or minus 2 up, 2 down.
So those are the possible microstates that we have, the 45, arranged by expectation value of total LZ and total SZ. We want to label our states in the end by L, LZ, S, and SZ. So we already have two out of the four quantum numbers that we want. So this state has a unique value of LZ and SZ, so it must belong to a unique set of L, LZ, S and SZ. Um, the total spin is 1, or the spin projected on the Z is 1. There is no LZ is 3 halves or 2, so this must be a total spin is equal to 1. So the microstate 2 up, 1 up must be a state with S is 1 and SZ is 1. We know that LZ is 3. There is no state with LZ is 4 and spin 1. So the angular momentum of this state is 3. We can now look at the state 2 up, 0 up. We know that SZ is 1, LZ is 2. The total spin is going to be 1 again. Now the total angular momenta, you have to ask your question, is this 2 or 3? And actually when you have a state with LS3, then it must have a state with LZ is 3, but also a state with LZ is 2. And there is only one state here, so this is the state with LS3 and LZ is 2. Now if we look at the LZ is 1 in the sector with SZ is 1. We have two possible microstates. And what we have seen before, we have the state with L is 3 and S is 1. And SZ is one of these states and that term must have a state with LZ is 1. So one of these, or a linear combination of these two, must belong to the term with L is 3 and S is 1. Now there is one more state of these. This state has SZ is 1, so it must belong to the state with S is 1. It has LZ is 1. And now the question is, what is L? If L would be 0, you cannot have an LZ is 1. If L would be 2, there should have been a state that LZ is 2. So LZ must be 1. So these two microstates are linear combinations of the state of L is 3 and S is 1 and the state that L is 1 and S is 1. Now if you want to find what linear combination this is, then we can start by applying the L minus operator on the state 3, 2, 1, 1. And if you do this, you get the state 3, 1, 1, 1, where LZ is lowered by 1. But there is of course a prefactor, and I'm going to put a prefactor on the right hand side. H bar divided by square root of L minus LZ plus 1 and L plus LZ, which is 1 over h bar, square root of 10, L minus, acting on the state 3, 2, 1, 1, but 3, 2, 1, 1 is equal to the single slater determinant with the electron 2 up and 0 up. Now, capital L minus is the lowering operator for all electrons summed over all electrons, so this is 1 over h bar, square root of 10, sum over all electrons, Li, L minus I, acting on 2 up, 0 up. So now we can act on the first one and act on the second one. Acting on the first one gives you h bar times the square root of L, and we have d electrons, so that is 2 
minus Lz plus 1, the square root of L plus Z, and divided by square root of 10, my h bars cancel, 1 up, 0 up, plus L minus Lz plus 1, L plus Lz, divided by the square root of 10 that we had here, 2 up minus 1 up. And this is square root of 2 fifths, 1 up, 0 up, plus square root of 3 fifths, 2 up, minus 1 up. Now this is the state with Alice 3. We argued before that it also has to be a state with L equal to 1. So now the question is what is our state 1, 1, 1, 1, L, L, Z, S, S, Z? Well, it has to be orthogonal to this state. We have a linear combination of two possible states and we can very easily write down the state that is orthogonal to the one that we had before. Because we know that the dot product has to be zero, so I just switched the prefactors and I put a minus sign for one of the two. And then we have the state with L is equal to one. Now this we can do not only for the states with S equal to one, which are the first column here, but we can also have a look at the states with LZ is zero, then we notice that this state is unique, so that must be a state with s is equal to 0 and l is equal to 4. Then here we have two microstates. One belongs to the state with l is equal to 3, s is equal to 1. One belongs to the state with s is 0, l is 4. Then we get three states here. One belongs to the l is 4, one belongs to the l is 3. And there is one more state, so we have an additional state with s is 0 and l is 2, or an additional term. And then here, three of them belong to the s is equal to 0 states, 2, <laughs> two, sorry, two of them belong to the S is 0 state, two of them belong to the S is 1 state. So we have four states and at this point we have three S is 0 states and two S is 1 states. And with that we know all our states that we have. So if you look at the D2 configurations, then we have several terms in there. We have the S is zero, total angular momentum is zero, so the singlet S, and I'm writing my terms in terms of 2S plus 1L. Then we have the singlet G, the triplet P, the singlet D, and the triplet F. We can also calculate the degeneracy And here we have S is 0, L is 0, so it's single fault degenerate, S is 1, L is 4, that is 9 fault degenerate, S is 1, L is 1, that is 3 times 3 is also 9 fault degenerate, S is 0, L is 5, uh, L is 2, that is 5 fault degenerate, S is 1, L is 3, that is 21 fault degenerate. And we can calculate the energy. And for that, you can pick one of the explicit representations of your state and then just look at the Slater integrals as well as the expectation values of your circle part by explicitly calculating the curl matrix elements for that state. Which we have here and then explicitly calculate it. 
for that collection part, explicitly calculating the interaction between your sets. If you do this, then you will find that all of them have an F0 component. So the F0 tells you how much pairs of electron you have in your shell is the spherical contribution. So in that respect, related to U for a single shell, uh, for a single default degenerate shell, plus 14 over 49, F2, plus F4. And I've already ordered them such that the energy goes from low to high. And you see that your uh, coupling of spherical harmonics has analytic expressions, um, but they're not going to be extremely beautiful. And naturally, you don't have to know these things by heart. You can always calculate them, or better said, have computers calculate them for you. Now, if we sum, then our total number of states is 45. And the total energy is 45 times F0 minus 2 over 63. F2 minus 2 over 63. F4. Now you might wonder that when you take a spherical average over the energy and you do a multiple expansion for your energy in a monopole part and quadrupole part and then the quantum dipole part, why that doesn't average to something that is spherical. But one should realize that we did not average over all possible states to have two electrons in 10 orbitals. But we do not allow states where electrons sit at the same position. So instead of having 100 states over which we average, we only have 45. And that then gives you something that is not spherical because the ways you can put two electrons in the same state is something that gives you a non-spherical charge density or a non-spherical overlap between them. So if you would neglect the Pauli principle and calculate then all your energies, so if you would have two electrons in different D shells, then the sum indeed would just be something spherical. So I have shown you uh, a little bit how we can calculate the different atomic energies. Um, we see that two electrons in a D shell split into five separate states and different energy. Uh, the energy splitting between these states ranges over several electron volts up to a Hedberg. And that actually um, is a very dominant energy scale in these type of materials. So whenever you have a system with an open D or F shell, then it is this energy that will definitely have to be diagonalized first. And then only within the lowest multiplet or the lowest term, you are able to do the physics and make your effective models. These uh, atomic excited states are often very sharp. So if you take a real material and you measure these type of excitations, even in metals, you will be able to very clearly recognize your atomic excitations. And it is this uh, very sharp localized in energy type of excitations that you, for example, use when you look um, at old church windows where they put in transition metal impurities in glass to have very sh uh, shallow band or very sharp excitations in energy so that you get very bright and vivid colors. So in that sense you can use them as pigments. Um, nowadays you can use uh, nanoscale materials to change your uh, absorption properties uh, which is probably cheaper than using transition metals as pigments in color and uh, paints. But using transition metals um, used to be a very good way to make pigments with very bright and vivid colors. Thank you very much for your attention. We see each other later.
Stay healthy. Stay healthy.